Welcome to Brawny Conversations. I am Patrick Braun, your host. This podcast will provide our listeners with informative and entertaining discussions held with experienced people covering a wide range of topics. If you want to shorten your learning curve or just learn more about one of our topics, this is the podcast for you. Enjoy our discussion. Chris Wheeler is our guest today. He is an expert in fitness training and obstacle course racing, referred to as OCR. Chris is a graduate of Clarkson University with an engineering degree and also has earned a MBA from College of St. Rose. I have had the great pleasure to work with Chris during the course of my career a couple of different times. When I first met Chris, he was a technical sales resource where he provided incredible value to our sales staff, and he actually gave us a competitive advantage in pursuing new business accounts. At that time, Chris was a very large man. Some might say overweight. Others might say large and in charge. Either way, Chris did not have the same body that he once had when he was an outstanding high school and collegiate baseball athlete. When I learned of his athletic accomplishments, it was hard to imagine Chris being the same guy. Fast forward eight years, and Chris and I had our second opportunity to work together. At this point, Chris, the athlete, was back, and I truly almost did not recognize him. He transformed his physique and his health completely, losing 100 pounds in less than 10 months. OCR, or obstacle course racing, was the sport that gave him the motivation, the competitive environment, and the community to make this transformation. And that's what this conversation today will be focused on. Chris, before we dive into the topic for today, we have to start by talking about where you are currently and what you're about to do. Stratton Mountain, Vermont, for the OCR World Championships. Tell us what this is all about. So, oh, thanks for having me, Patrick. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. So, um, yep, yeah, as you just said, I'm, I'm up here in the great Northeast. Uh, we're going to be uh, tackling the uh, uh, OCR World Championship weekend. Um, the event I'm going to be focusing in is actually it's a uh, 15k race, um, but they do have a full array of different distances, including a um, they have a hundred meter short course, more of like a ninja course that people race through. Um, there's a fast course that's a three kilometers, and then they also have a, a team charity event on Sunday. Um, but the premier event is the 15k that I'll be taking part in. So it's a um, OCR is a, a growing sport with a fantastic community. And what this uh, championship is, is it's a collaboration of the majority of the race series coming together and putting on one stellar event where they have each of their um, signature obstacles are there. And it just kill, comes up for one killer course because you're seeing the best of the best of what all the races have to provide. So it's just a lot of fun, a lot of really good people. And then you just make a, a ton of memories. So um, really excited to get out there tomorrow and really just, just see what a year's worth of work has done for me since the last time I was there. It sounds like there's going to be a lot of highly fit and motivated people having a lot of fun at high altitude. Is that pretty much a, a good description? Yeah, we're going to have a lot of motivated people that are, are going to enjoy going up and down on the mountain way too many times. And uh, it's scary to think that we pay to do this, but here we are I'm going to go do it. So, Chris, how long will this 15K event with obstacles take you? Um, my goal tomorrow is going to be doing it anywhere between two hours and 15 minutes and two hours and 45 minutes. Um, okay. we, we kind of space it out that way because of the way, um, these courses go, you don't know how the obstacle layout is going to be exactly how the climb to everyone. And of course, um, we have some weather that's moving forth through the Northeast. And so we don't know if we're going to get a little rain tomorrow or whatnot, that might just really change the conditions where maybe things are a bit slicker. Um, the cool air is really kicked into um, this time last year when we did this event, it was 70 degrees and we started tomorrow, it's probably going to be in the forties. So there's just a lot of different uh, variables out there that once you get out there, it, it can really change things up for the athletes. Wow. Okay. That's a lot. That's a lot of different factors you have to counter uh, and, and, and plan for now uh, the two hour and 15 minutes. If you, if you complete it in that time frame. Does that make you the winner? Does that put you in the top 10, the top half? Give us some perspective on that. So last year, the winner of the course, they did it, I believe, in two hours and three minutes. Um, and then the uh, last top 10 finisher was two hours and 25 minutes. So if I were to hit my 215 time, I, that would put me, uh, assuming all things being equal, that would put me in the top 10, which is where I'd like to be. Okay, very good. And now I understand there's both open and professional categories. Are you referring to the open category? No, I'd be referring to, uh, the, well, they actually break it up into um, 
the pro, then there's the, the age group competitive waves, and then there's the, the open waves. I'd be competing in the age groups. Okay. Very good. Very good. So you're highly competitive at this, at this sport. Yes. Very good. Well, that's why you're here. You're an expert. Um, all right. I've got to ask you, who is this war paint Waldo that I keep hearing and reading about? All right. So um, when I first got into the sport, uh, I really I took a very methodical approach to it. I knew whenever what I do, um, I go into it full hearted. I, I go full bore. And so I tend to be measured in my approach to make sure that I, I set myself up to succeed. And so I did my first uh, Spartan race with a group of adaptive athletes and we went through. And for some reason, And every team picture we took, whether it was on the course or even at the finish line, my head just seemed kind of popped up like, uh, you know, you just find Chris's head popping up somewhere. And the running joke in the group became, it was like, oh, where's Waldo? And when I first started racing, I used to wear eye black from baseball to help. um, I don't like running with sunglasses usually or things like that, but it helps keep the sun out of your eyes. So I kind of would have painting on my face with the eye black. And so the joke became that they'll call me war paint Waldo. And that's how the name started. And it just kind of stuck. Okay. It makes sense. I like the name. It stands out. It's memorable. Okay. Now you, you play a role, uh, in a, a website that is focused to OCR. It's called OCR addict. What is your role, uh, on that website? All right. So OCR Addict, um, it was actually founded by another coworker um, that I worked with at a previous life. We were uh, ironically in Vermont. Um, we had just we had been working together actually for about six months and we randomly found on the company intranet that we both had the same hobby. And so we ended up connecting and, and uh, sharing a, a, a lodge together. And we just decided as we were talking, as we got ready for our big race that, hey, we should, you know, we're really good at what we do, but we should do this for obstacle horse racing. And so we that really literally that night, we founded the idea of what would become OCR Attic. And so um, we're effectively a, a, a race series um, consultant group, but we also do a lot of um, uh, free uh, training tips and information. And we want to become a free repository to the racer. So that way they can go and they can help get themselves better prepared to learn what they're getting into and how they can be better. And so uh, my role is uh, we well, we really are just um, we're partners. I took on the role of CMO where I'm more of the face. I'm the one that will reach out to races, manufacturers of equipment, all these different pieces where we can go out and talk about how uh, we can work together and network together and people can get their brands out, test equipment. And for us, we're able to bring back valuable data to the races that we're trying to help grow or become more stable, as well as give valuable information to the racer who might not otherwise have that ability to reach out and gather information because um, a lot of beginners, one of their biggest things they don't want to do is ask questions. And so this is a way for them in a, a non-intimidating factor. They can go and they can start getting some valuable data so they can start forming um, better questions and they can get an idea what they're doing. Or by the time that they're ready to reach out into more of the open forums, they feel like they're in a better position to ask a question. So this is a fantastic resource that anybody, any of our listeners that are interested in, in learning more about obstacle course racing and, and looking to get some information, how to get started and the tools you need and uh, training tips and all that good stuff, they can find right here at your website, OCR Addict. Yes. Okay, perfect. We'll make sure we publish that information. That's fantastic. And, and it is a really cool website, really cool resource. Um, I was reading over one of the training plans that, that you've done in the past for an Ultra Beast event, which um, sounds terrible. <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds intense. But as I was reading the workout plan, I was like, Oh my goodness. It was, uh, it was quite extensive and quite amazing. And we're not going to go into that today, but I would encourage, uh, anybody listening to this to just go to OCR addict and, and look at, at Chris's training plan. It's under war paint Waldo for the ultra beast. Um, and an, a really a light day on that training plan is the Murph workout. And if you're not familiar with the word Murph workout, It's brutal. So uh, check it out and you'll really see uh, what kind of intense training these OCR athletes do to be competitive at a top level. It's very impressive and kind of crazy. And we're going to get into how Chris is able to ultimately get to that level uh, through our conversation today. So, Chris, let's uh, let's just start out by just 
you know, you're sitting down for this conversation. You and I have known each other for years, but what are your thoughts and expectations as we start this process? Um, I mean, really, honestly, I just think it's a really good opportunity for us just to go over a lot of different materials. There's so many different paths that um, people can go when they're looking out for their goals and uh, being on this venture where I've been an athlete and then not been an athlete and back to being an athlete. I've just learned that there's a lot of different ways. As long as you're focused on your goal, you can get there. It's just taking that drive and discipline to get yourself to where you want to be. For sure. All right. Well, we're going to get started. Let's start our conversation with what things were like for you as a high school and collegiate athlete. Tell us about the sports you played, the accomplishments you had, and how you ended up playing college baseball. Um, so, um, I went to a very, uh, small Christian high school. Uh, so I was a group of a very, uh, a very small group of people. So, um, I did end up playing one year of varsity basketball, but basketball was never really a passion of mine. It was really just an activity that did burn off energy, but my real focus was in baseball. Um, now at the time when my high school was, uh, was coming together, the, I was literally part of one of the introductory classes to form the high school. And so outside of some legacy sports from when they were a middle school, they had no baseball program. They had no other, there were other sports that just weren't there because they just weren't there before. So um, I literally had to start a baseball program from scratch with the help of the um, athletic director at our school. And that included helping to reach out to um, the New York state athletic board, finding out what, what, where we could actually comp compete, who we could compete against, what uh, class size would be considered against. Uh, and then once we had that approval and the school wanted to go with it, then it became, all right, how do we recruit somebody who wants to coach us? And, and in turn will actually help transport a lot of us to games. And um, how do we actually be able to afford all the equipment we need as a baseball team? Because, um, you know, the basic player, they'll get their cleats, they'll get their glove, et cetera. But we needed baseball. We needed bats. We needed catcher's equipment. We needed all these other auxiliary supplies that really aren't that cheap. And I mean, and heck, even with them, baseball bats, even back in the nineties, if you, probably, you needed at least three or four team bats. And that, you know, when you're in a very small high school trying to raise, a, you know, 500 to a thousand dollars to get bats and balls was, you know, quite the task, especially at 14. So that was kind of my, my first real foray, I guess, into sales was, you know, convincing people that there was value in helping the, the school bring a baseball team to the school. Um, then once we actually got going, that again, got to start having some fun. Um, by the time I was all said and done, um, I was a section two all-star multiple times. Um, I was our team captain. Um, and then it really was a good opportunity because uh, we were in a, such a small high school. We would recruit other players who really were just athletic in other veins or other disciplines. And um, in high school, you can kind of get away with not being a specialist because you're young, you're flexible, and you can be really versatile. But because I was one of only three players who actually had regularly played high, played baseball going all the way up through high school, um, that kind of was, hey, we have a hole or somebody's sick this day or somebody's injured. Can you go plug here? And I kind of learned how to become a, a – more than functional utility player. Um, and because I had the, the baseball IQ, I was able to become serviceable pretty quickly. Um, but from there, it was really was baseball was just a year round sport for me. It was a spring ball, summer ball, fall ball. And then in the winter, when it was snowing, I was going, I was taking indoor lessons or I was working in indoor facilities. So I could go and really work on mechanics, form areas, improvement from the last year. And just uh, really made it an all year focus. I understand that well. As you know, my, my two sons are baseball players and went through that whole routine. And uh, so very familiar with the high school process and, and the amount of time involved. It, it definitely is a commitment. Um, how did you end up playing college baseball? So interesting high school, right? Started at that, at that private school and helped build a program. How did you get discovered by the college coach in order to go play? So um, I ended up playing at one of our local uh, co community colleges. I was someone who want, was determined to go through and, and pay for college on my own. And so that was one of my first fiscal steps was, well, a four-year school is really way more expensive. But if I split it up over the, the JUCO route, I could save a lot of money. And so um, my high school coach uh, was, uh, was had a relationship with the uh, – the college coach and he gave him my name. He came out to a few of my games and, you know, said, Hey, you know, you're really somebody who I could see a lot of value in and I want you to come out and, and try to play with us. And so it was perfect because the Juco was uh, 
a school already on my radar because they were really, really known for their math and science program and being wanting to be an engineer. Math and science was the foundation of what my bachelor's would be anyway. So it really was a, a perfect fit. Um, it's a school I'm actually very proud that I went to. Um, I know most people don't typically brag about it, a junior college, but I, I really um, felt like I got my best undergrad education at that college. So um, a lot of props out to Hudson Valley Community College for what they bring to the student body. Yeah, Chris, that's a that's actually a, a very smart approach and uh, a great way to get the first couple of years of your undergraduate under your belt at a much lower cost. And and obviously, um, you got to be a college athlete there as well that opened the door to, to go on and, and play at even a higher level. So you were a utility player in high school playing all kinds of, of positions. What position did you play at the JUCO? Um, so in college, I was pitching and then I would I mix between the corner infield spots. So okay. uh, I played in first and third, um, you know, even though even in college, I was in much better shape by, by then compared to how he first met me. Uh, I was still a bigger guy. I was playing between the 220 and the 230 uh, range. So I was still pretty big. And so at that level, even though I had the, the hand skills and the, uh, the glove skills to go and uh, play the, in, the middle and the quarter infield, they, was just, they were better athletes for the overall top end speed to play up the middle. So that's where, where, they, were, where they parked me. And I, I had a lot of fun playing there. Okay. Very good. Very good. Well, obviously you are, uh, were very successful. You played at that level. Um, a common thought with, with, you know, many players that play at the collegiate level, uh, are to play the game professionally. Did you ever have any opportunities or any thoughts about doing that? Um, I had uh, a few opportunities to, you know, go to some trials. I was invited to some trials because, um, I was one of those interesting little packages of where I had some, big bursts of power where if everything went right, I, especially with a wooden bat at 18, I was still able to hit the ball well over 400 feet. I could really do it. Well, um, but I was more of a hitter who was built for average. I like to go and spread the ball around the field. I like to go get my hits. And honestly, that was my playing style was more indicative of somebody who should have been 50 to 60 pounds lighter. Um, I was meant more for that meant to be more up the middle or playing in the outfield, running around and, and hitting for average. And so I, um, well, I obviously would have loved to have the opportunity to go and play independent or minor league baseball. I think as I kind of reflect back, especially now that I'm lighter now than I ever was in high school, uh, I have those thoughts of a, what if, if I could have been in a place like Texas where they took the complete portion of your athleticism into account, which included the nutrition. And I had yeah. someone help me put the fork down and or explain what would be better to put on my fork. And I was playing at a weight like I am now, how different that could have been because I obviously would have been much faster. I would have been more acquainted for what I wanted to do. And maybe I would have been a more attractive on that side, but, uh, it was easy to think in high school, of course, I'm going to be a pro, but in retrospect, it was like, I can kind of see where, where I would have had to improve to really have made a, a better effort at it. It was just one of those things at that age, you just didn't know any better. A hundred percent. And that's, you know, people listening that tuned into this to hear about obstacle course racing are probably wondering why you're talking so much about baseball. Well, there's, there's a method to the madness here. And, and the method is, you know, a, using your training for obstacle course racing, if you would have done that when you were 16, 17, 18, what kind of baseball player would you have been? Right. Oh, uh, <laughs> Amazing. Oh, uh, exactly. I mean, those are thoughts that come into my head. Um, I mean, even in what I've chosen in obstacle course racing, where I focused the more on the endurance side it, it, you can see where the marrying came through because I really enjoyed being a starting pitcher. Um, I enjoyed being out there and having everything on me, but also being out there for a hundred to 125 pitches and just really going and putting my body under some punishment, but going back to the well over and over and over again. And that's the, the correlation between the two is right there. It's just, um, it was just obviously doing it in a completely different vein, but I can't help but think if I had the nutritional discipline to support the physical trainings, a portion of what I was doing, how different that would have been. Yeah, it's uh, and, and 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 to be very candid, right? The the way people train today is very different than the way people trained twenty and thirty years ago. Uh, everything has evolved, and so it, there's not one what right way to do it. And what we're finding is the more you mix up training and and you know include traditional workouts plus non traditional workouts, you become uh, you know at a higher level of fitness and performance. And that's really what OCR is all about. Um, 
So let's, let's fast forward a little bit. So now you're an engineer, you've, you've a degreed engineer, you've got an MBA and you're transitioning away from baseball into your professional career. Were there lessons that you learned um, in baseball that translated to help you succeed in your business career? I, I would say, honestly, the big piece would be is just, you always have to assume that you're about to go up against somebody that's better than you. Um, so either they have the raw talent that's going to surpass you, um, what, or they're going to have experience and they've seen things that you haven't seen before. And so you have to be ready to, to outperform them in one way or other, whether it's you're going to be working harder once you're engaged in the situation, or um, you're going to have to work smarter than they are. And you just have to find the right, the right combination of those energies to go and, and succeed and get on top. It's truth. That is absolute truth. Chris, when I first met you, you were a really big man. What were the main factors that caused you to put on so much weight? And ultimately, how did you change these factors to change your body and bring back the athlete? So, um, well, the real piece that ended my, my venture as to wanting to become a pro baseball player was, um, during a playoff run, I stretched my arm out too much. I kept pushing. I was pushing through pain because my team needed me. And I got my UCL, which is the ligament um, most commonly associated with Tommy John surgery. I had stretched it out to the point where if you were looking at it on a an MRI, it, it, the best comparison is you've stretched out a rubber band. And while you quite haven't made a hole in the, in the tendon yet or in the rubber band yet, you could see that it was about to go. So while I hadn't actually physically broken anything yet, you could tell my, my arm was just right for it. And so mm. it was one of those things that if um, maybe if I had been right left-handed and I threw 90 to 92, instead of throwing 90, 92 as a righty, someone probably would have performed Tommy John on me, wanted to perform Tommy John on me in uh, 2003. But um Righties that throw 90 are, are a dime a dozen. So I was kind of, I was pretty much done at that point. But when I retired, when a bit more or less uh, retired from grander pursuits, I just put all that energy into my business side. Um, I'm someone that definitely fully commits to myself to whatever I'm doing, no matter what I'm doing. And so I put all that focus that was going into the gym or going onto the diamond and it went into being the best MPS specialist I could be. And MPS, um, for those who don't know, that's just, it's called um, managed print services. It was the specialty that got me into the industry that United or brought Patrick and I together. And, um, I just put all that focus and energy into learning about the industry as well as what I could do to really make an impact. Because at the time when I got in, it, what I was doing was more of a concept and people were still struggling to figure out how you could make it provide both value to the organization as well as to their partners who they were providing the services to. Um, and I kept eating like I was still being on the diamond. I never made any adjustments there. I was very good at being able to put a lot of food, food down very quickly. Um, and because I wasn't running f uh, four or five miles a day and hitting the weight room for 90 minutes to two hours every day, um, my body adjusted accordingly and allowed me to become a man of more than heroic stature. <laughs> um, and it, it got to the point where it just kept on growing and growing and growing um, where I started to actually have some heart issues where I could just, I was walking around and I could feel like something wasn't right, but I was used to just pushing through things and I kept going and going. And eventually it got to the point where I had a moment where I said, there's something wrong and I need to go see somebody. So surely enough, I, I went to my doctor, uh, I started talking through what I was doing. And um, Chris, how, how old were you at this point? I want to say, what was I? 28, 29. Okay. So st still a young man. Yeah. So, um, I just remember him distinctly saying I was a monster and a hamburger away from a heart attack. Wow. Um, that must've been very, very scary to hear that. Uh, and it was, it, it honestly was one of those, it was a weird exchange because the doctor presented in a way where he didn't really have any bedside manner. He was actually rather blunt and, uh, blunt about it and almost flipping about it. And I really didn't leave that doctor's appointment feeling like, Oh, I have to make a change. It was more of, well, this doctor is such a jerk. Um, mm. He wasn't doing anything to help me. And it really didn't make it. It didn't really motivate me to do anything. It just made me annoyed with the doctor. Okay. Um, but what kind of happened was, is I, I took some time to simmer down. A few more weeks went by and on new year's Eve, 
um, I got on the scale and I, and I kind of, that's where I had my moment. Um, the scale said 300 and it just all of a sudden all clicked in my head. I was like, you know, this is ridiculous. I was a college athlete. I performed at a really high level and I should know, I should know better than this. I should have the discipline to be better and I have to make a change. And so for me, um, like so many others, I had that new year's resolution. I was like, I'm going to lose the weight. Um, and so I just remember a few days later, I made, I remember walking into uh, my local 24 hour fitness and I told him, I said, I need to get my, my fat butt in shape. And the guy laughed at me and chuckled because it sounded like he had heard that about 20 times already that day. Um, but I signed up for my membership and I started getting, getting back at it. Um, I knew from my college days that from a strength and basic standpoint, I knew I could handle the, um, the physical training. What I really needed to is this time around is I needed to, I needed to do something about the nutrition. So, okay. um, I went with the, uh, I had finally started to learn that there's no real way to shortcut your way to success. Um, I think one of my bigger struggles when, especially when I was in high school and college is that was at the time when these supplement companies were releasing some really good marketing that if you took your pill after three weeks, you could drop 30 pounds. And I had <laughs> kind of taught myself or made myself believe that I could hack my way through a bad diet. And what I started to really learn, especially as I was getting older, that, you know, maybe I really couldn't do it because I had tried it for so long. And even though I would have, when I would take these things, I would have some level of success. It was nowhere near what the magazine was telling me I was going to have. Yeah. Um, so I really, I took advantage of what was around me at the time to really just start with the basics. I decided instead of just doing a crash diet or hopping on Atkins or hopping whatever on the, what the sexy diet was at the time was I was going to tr try to break it down all the basics. And what that really meant with was truly the basics. Um, yeah, Chris, that's uh, you had a learning that, you know, there's some, some sayings out there, like there are no free lunches, right? That really means there's no shortcuts. You've, you've got to, you've got to do it right to get the results that you want. If you try and take shortcuts, it ends up, you end up not reaching your goals or there end up being negative ramifications, right. Of, of taking the shortcut. So I think that's what you're, you're talking about how it took you a bit. You tried some shortcuts, but ultimately you found your way to the right formula to make this thing a lifestyle. Exactly. And so for me, that formula, like I was mentioning earlier, was just, I, I broke it down to basics. So instead of going to kale or cutting out all forms of carbs, what I did was um, if I went out to a restaurant I, or even at home, I made the grilled version instead of the fried. Um, instead of having a beer, I'd have a Diet Coke. Instead of taking the elevator, I would take the stairs. And so I started making these little, very little and subtle changes um, where I was still getting, you know, especially on the food side, for the most part, I was hitting the taste buds the way I wanted to. I was still getting, putting flavor in my mouth for a beverage. Um, I was able to satisfy that part of the, of the urge of what I want, why I was putting something in my body in the first place, but I wasn't shocking my system. It was all very subtle and gradual. And so my body was willing to adapt it. And by the time I had gotten four or five months in, then it started turning to, well, now I'm already adjusted. So now I can tighten things down more and more and more, but I wasn't rejecting it. It was just habit. And so it was building a roadmap for me to go and make it sustainable as opposed to what, like most people, they go, they make a great change. They can sustain it for six, you know, three to six months. And then afterwards it all dissipates because they go back to the way they were before and it all comes back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's uh, your approach. You ultimately got to the, to the life changing approach where it became a lifestyle and, and it wasn't just a, a short term hobby, right? It became your, yes. became your life. All right. So, Hey, let's, uh, let's spin into this obstacle course racing. So you're starting to get fit. Now you're starting to change your life. You've got a new lifestyle, how you're eating, how you're working out. Where did obstacle course racing come in? how did you become interested and involved in it? So obstacle course racing might've been one of those great opportunities or situations in life where it was the right situation for the right time and seizing the opportunity of what was put, about, put in front of me. Um, I got roped into doing my first obstacle course race by actually um, for work. Um, a bunch of people had signed up for one as part of a team builder. It was a team I was supporting at the, my current job. And so um, I was making these guys do a lot of things that changed their way of daily life. And so 
they kind of they they wrote me into it, but I distinctly remember signing up for this thing and saying to my in my head, "Who the hell pays eighty dollars to go run through the mud?" <laughs> I thought it was the stupidest thing I ever heard of. I couldn't understand why anyone was paying that. I figured I could go in my backyard and run in the green belt and do the same thing for free. Why did anyone ever want to do this? Yet alone pay for it. And it's a great question. But um, it, I used it as a motivator um, to start running because I knew I was going to have to run a, a, a run at least five kilometers, and I didn't want to have to walk the five kilometers. I wanted to be able to run it or at least jog most of it. Um, and so I use that as preparation because I signed up for about signed up for it about a month before the actual race. Okay. Um, about a week before that race, um, I had actually already lost 80 or not 80 pounds, 60 pounds. Um, and I saw my doctor because we were following up on all the other issues I was having. And what he had told me was that I had lost the waist, the weight so fast that based on that, his expectation was statistically, I was bound to put all, not only put that weight back on, but I was probably actually going to end up being heavier than I was before because, um, most people losing weight at that rate, it wasn't a sustainable loss. Something would happen either. Um, I was going to push it too far and I was going to hurt my metabolism and my body was going to start rejecting what I was doing. And then that in turn would lead to weight gain. Or, um, the more common one is eventually you, um, throw a fit and decide I'm not going to eat like this or I'm not going to behave like this anymore. And you go back to all your bad habits. Wow, and, that, was, that was an interesting message to receive. How'd you respond to that one? Um, for me, especially because at that point I was, I was very determined to not put it back on. It was like he was putting a, waving a red flag to a bull. Um, <laughs> I, I was, I left yet another doctor's appointment pretty angry, uh, partly because I knew the doctor just didn't know me. And so he was talking about a subject that he really didn't, have understanding in. Um, so I just use that as I, I, as a bit of a bit of fire. Um, I was determined to find a way that there was no way I was going to let this happen again. Um, I wasn't necessarily determined to even at that point to say, I wanted to lose a hundred pounds at that point. I was actually, you know, I had just gotten back to my, the weight I got, I, I was married. Um, I wanted to lose a few more pounds, but that was ultimately the goal. But surely enough, um, I got about a mile into that race and all of a sudden I could just feel that bug hit me um, that I hadn't felt since I was playing baseball. So, so Chris, this doctor provided you with motivational fuel. Is what yes. it was. <laughs> um, and I mean, it, you know, you might almost want to call it, you know, it's almost like a um, pre Goggins Goggins like approach where he was just telling you, he was telling me what I needed to hear, not what I wanted to hear. Yeah. Um, and at the time I just, I wouldn't, that was not something that had really become uh, a sexy thing for people to hear where we had, we for a while, um, it was more of ex accepting bad ha or habits for what they were and how can we work with it? And we're going to accept it for what it was as opposed to, Hey, no, if you really want to meet your goal, you need to put this down or you need to wake up an hour earlier or you need to be able to do this thing that really hadn't really started to hit uh, popularity yet. And, um, he definitely, uh, he gave me, I was, gave me that motivation or he did it in just the right way that, um, he made me really think about what I was doing and why I was doing it and how was I going to keep it going once I got to my goals. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes, sometimes we all need a splash of cold water in the face, right? Reality communicated very directly to get your attention and uh, knowing you and your personality and how driven you are, that's probably the only way that you would have received the message. <laughs> No, I can definitely agree with that. It's, um, I'm a very, obviously a very driven person. So sometimes it's just that direct challenge that makes me, it almost makes me center set or reset to where, what I was really doing or why I got into this in the first place to really focus on what I'm going after. So that doesn't get lost because with life, there's so many distractions. There's so many things that are pulling at you that it's very easy to sometimes lose your course without even realizing you've lost your course. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um, so here you are, you're in your first obstacle course race. You, you, you said you're, you're basically a mile in and then you're catching the bug and you're here like, this is pretty cool. Right. Yes. Um, but you're a pure beginner and, and, you know, we've got people out there that, that have never done an obstacle course race, but might based on this conversation, sign up for one to see what it's about. What were some of the challenges that you had to overcome as a beginner? Um, well, 
the biggest challenge I would say is you just don't, you don't know what you're getting into yet. Um, so my recommendation to people uh, would be is just find out or just sign up for one and give it a try. Um, and what that will allow you to do is, is it'll allow you to see what you're getting into. Um, it will allow you to go and, um, really just kind of find out where your niche in the sport is. Uh, there's so many places, whether it's you're somebody like me who wants to really compete and push themselves to there's this people who go out there and they're looking to better themselves. They're not looking to go and uh, lose a hundred pounds, but they want to have live a healthier lifestyle. They want to go and um, hang out and, and bond with people that are like-minded interest. Um, and it really just gives you a good starting point to go out and, and find out what you want to do. Okay. Very good. Very good. So uh, you've done a lot of these races now. I mean, how many, how many do you think you've done? Just, just ballpark. Uh, it has to be 50 plus at this point. Okay. 50 plus. That's a lot. Um, you have to have some funny experiences that you've had that our listeners can not only learn from, but also probably have a funny laugh. So share a couple with us. Um, so I would say, <laughs> The big, uh, the f- so for funny stories, I'm going to say the big lesson I would tell you is, or a life lesson is, um, never mess with your nutrition pre event, um, Uh-oh. or be ready to ha- be ready to have unplanned pit stops. Uh oh. Um, I, and I've been lucky enough to not have, uh, had this issue myself, but I've had some very good friends who are rather battle hardened people who, um, I have caught up to who have, because they made that mistake. Um, and let's just say we had some fun looks as I ran past them on the trail as they were against a tree. But, oh, Lord. Yeah, that could be a problem. I'm thinking about you being at Stratton Mountain Resort, uh, you know, I don't know, 4,000 feet up in the woods. And uh, there's probably not a lot of restrooms out there. I guess say, you don't know if it's a bear in the woods or it's a racer in the woods, but uh, there's somebody <laughs> no. in the woods. <laughs> All right. So don't mess with your pre-race nutrition. Practice it in advance and uh, don't change the day of the race. So, um, yeah, that's, de- that's definitely uh, the lesson I would, I would, I would share with you. It, it's a little bit of humor for you, but, uh, yep. it, it's still something that will pay dividends for you. No. And Hey, that rings true as I'm, you know, I've got this full Ironman coming up in November and that's one of the key tenets is practice your nutrition during your training and don't try anything new on race day. And, uh, you know, same thing, um, won't be in the woods, but, uh, I don't sure they're, there won't be a whole lot of porta potties there in uh, the desert in Tempe, Arizona. So <laughs> I'm going to teed that advice for sure. Uh, all right, Chris. So you've been pursuing this a while. Um, what's your most memorable experience in doing OCR races? What's one moment that stands out in your mind? Um, one real moment I think is funny or uh, is the most memorable to me is my. Uh, actually all happened post race. And what it was is, um, I had finished, um, an ultra beast in Killington, Vermont, which is where OCR Attica started. And at the time I had finished, uh, or according to the timing booth, I had actually finished fifth. And so I was really happy with that. It's a, it's a killer race. It's a uh, considered Spartan signature event. It's their hardest, uh, hardest race because, um, it's, a black diamond mountain, the course it's really brutal terrain and you have time limits. So you have to really push yourself. It's there's some courses where you can walk the, you could simply walk the course and you can finish the course. And then there's others that no matter what you, what happens, you have to push yourself to get to the finish line in time. There's no easy way to go and get to your buckle. Okay. Um, so I was really happy with that. Um, but I did notice, you know, at the time I was like, Oh, maybe there's going to be there. Um, Spartan uses uh, a penalty system. If you fail an obstacle called burpees. And so they do do video reviews of everyone that does burpees. Um, and so I was like, Oh, well they're second to fifth. We're all really tied packed together. Um, and I watched it for an hour or two and nothing had changed. Nothing had changed. So I had gotten to the point where I was just, okay, I'm going to be fifth. That's respectable. I can, I can hang my hat on that. It's something to be really proud of. And all of a sudden, a few hours later, um, we're still waiting for friends to finish to come down the mountain. I hadn't left yet. Um, we were just, like I said, relaxing. And all of a sudden, two of my friends just start getting up and screaming. Hmm. Um, 
And they were checking on other friends to see if they had finished because it was a rather large area. You know, someone finishes and unless you know they're coming, it's hard to be there when they're on the finish line. And they started yelling, Chris, Chris, along with some not suitable work terms, um, you're third. And I, our course was like, no, I can't be right. I've been fifth for a few hours. How is that going to happen? And et cetera. And, but surely enough, they went and they showed me and then I get, we, I start getting jazzed up. We end up running to the timing booth. Uh, we're trying to figure out what's going on. Is this real? Because I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want a system glitch to make me think I had, you know, made up, made my first podium at Spartan without really actually having made it. And then surely enough, what happened is um, for those who don't know what an ultra beast is, is um, it's a two lap race format. So you have to actually run the course twice to get your 50 kilometers in. Okay. And what had happened was, is I actually ended up who the person who was um, second and fourth actually had more or less, I had lapped them. They hadn't finished their first lap by the time I effectively was finishing my second lap. And because at that time they knew they weren't going to make their time hack and they had officially DNF'd, they just crossed the finish line instead of going into their transition area. Okay. So wow. the ship didn't cool. know any better. Yeah, the ship didn't know any better. It just said, oh, they finished. Congratulations, you're second. But later on, as the timing people were reconciling, they say, hey, you did not hit any of our timing maps for your second lap. All and right. they confirmed that they actually hadn't finished the race at all. That's really cool. So that was your first podium in a Spartan? Yes. Oh, that's awesome. Um, that but is these awesome. people being so happy for me while me being completely oblivious to me, um, it was just something that's always sticks in my head. Uh, it's definitely obviously a fond memory in the sport because it, it's just, like I said, it's funny. It's silly. Um, but it also just kind of shows that community. Um, when others succeed, you very rarely see buddy, somebody like, you know, frowning on them and, and putting that pouty face because you finished well and they didn't. It's everyone comes together and they're really legitimately happy for each other for that when they succeed. Yeah, you know, that seems that community is a common thread that that seems to be in all endurance sport communities, right? Including obstacle course racing, including marathons or mountain bike racing, or I'm experiencing it in the triathlon community uh, and the Ironman community. Um, and that's really neat. And that's one of the reasons why you keep doing it is because you make these friends and you enjoy training together and racing together. And, you know, I'm sure this weekend in Vermont, you're going to race and compete and hang out with people that you haven't seen in a while, but that you've been racing with for years. Yes. Uh, um, it keeps you motivated, right? Yeah. I mean, I can speak to that as this last year when I went to the world championships, uh, it was the first time I had seen people who I consider really good friends in over two years because of COVID. And I just remember us getting together and just giving each other a, a hug and how it was a common theme. It was people would just say to each other, Oh God, it just feels good to be normal again. Um, because we hadn't seen people that we were used to seeing, you know, anywhere between three to 12 times a year. Yeah. And, uh, we finally got to be, get to that together instead of just, you know, sending text messages or going through Facebook to say hi to each other. You know, as humans, relationships are important to our well being, right? Spiritual, mental, physical, we need relationships with other humans. And, uh, you know, it's cool that, that the obstacle course racing community um, helps to satisfy that for you and, and other racers. It's pretty awesome. Yes. So, Chris, what have the benefits to you been personally? from competing and training for obstacle course racing? I would say the biggest benefit is just reestablishing that discipline. Um, that, that discipline that I, I let go behind when I stopped playing baseball, it really reestablished it. Um, endurance sports in particular, not just the basic obstacle course racing, but the survival events I do or the 50Ks and beyond I do, that just requires a lot of time on your feet and a lot of time on training. And there's only so many hours in a day and so many hours in a week where a lot of times you have to get up and you have to get going and you have to do your work then regardless of how you feel because there's no way you're going to get, get at that in any other time unless you do it now. Um, and if you don't do it then, then you're wasting all those other times you woke up and you felt perfectly motivated to go out and get the work done. So it really just builds on each other where you understand that some of the most important work you're going to do are on days where you have absolutely zero interest of in doing any of that work. But in the long run, you ultimately have to choose that hard. And so it's, it, it becomes a powerful motivator just to tell that voice in your head to say, you know, just stay in or sleep in, or you don't need to do it today to go shut up and get, get it done because, um, you're only going to get the work done if you go and do the work. 
Yeah, Chris, I, you know, that establishing discipline, uh, I know you and I are cut from the same cloth in that regard. And, and my method of doing that is, you know, just like a business appointment, all of my training goes right on my calendar, right on my work calendar. And uh, do you follow that same? Do you, do you put it on your calendar and, yeah. and get it done just like a meeting? Um, well, for me, what I'm using is uh, the, the coach I work with actually has his own app. So I do have a calendar I reference and it's all there. Um, so I don't have it synced with work, but it's one of those pieces where I know I instinctively every day go and I wake up um, as well as usually right before I go to bed as I'll go and I'll read what, what am I supposed to do the next day? So in my head, I already have it there. And then when I wake up, um, I'm admittedly not always the best person in the world when I wake up. So it's one of those things where um, reinforcing the last one of the last memories I had before I went to sleep. The first time I wake up, it helps me get moving. Okay, good. But you, you definitely have a place where it's written down and you're looking at it on a daily basis. Yes. And, uh, and that's, that's a common theme. I think all highly competitive athletes that are training for, for this type of event, you have to write it down. Uh, you have to have it planned in advance and you have to make it part of your daily routine, whether it's on a calendar or in an app, uh, you've got to block the time off to get it done. So yes. very good. Um, Chris, what advice would you offer to someone who's interested in doing obstacle course racing, but just has no idea where to start? Um, the real thing I would say, and I think I already hit on this point earlier, was just go sign up and do one, in particular for OCR. Um, I know people who are much larger than I will, even was at my worst who are, out, who are out going out there and doing these races. Now, they're not necessarily going out and tackling the 50 kilometer races like I am, but there are versions out there that where that you can go out in any condition and there's going to be people out there who are going to help you um, feel welcome. They're going to help you complete the obstacles. They'll help you through things and you can really go out there and get an idea of what you would like out of the sport or, you know, whether it's just, Hey, I want to do this a couple of times a year. It's fun, but you know, it's really not going to be a focus of mine to all the way up to, Oh yeah, th this is the new weekend hobby or this is the new weekend sport. And this is where I'm going to put my energy to. This is why my why at the gym on why I'm working so hard or why I'm eating clean because I want to get faster and faster and faster and better and better and better. Okay. So Hey, just, just get started. Just sign up and figure it out. Right. Yeah. Um, All that's right. the, the beauty of a lot of these cardio based sports is, you know, you can start off with just the basics, you know, the regular shoes you're wearing or an old pair of tennis shoes that you're not afraid to go get dirty in the mud. And that allows you to get started. And then you can worry about all the expensive stuff or the, the higher end stuff later, once you kind of figure out what you want or what, where you are. Okay. Great advice. Great advice. So what would you tell the person who's more experienced and is ready to take it to the next level? So my advice to the more um, experienced or seasoned athlete, and this is something that I found I really had to learn for myself was find yourself a good coach, not just any coach, um, but find a coach who's aligned with your goals um, because that's really going to help. What's going to do is going to help you get to that next level. Um, as you all know, I was obviously a college athlete. Um, I knew exactly what I needed to do from a weight training standpoint. I knew how to get myself really strong. Um, and I, you know, I had gotten accustomed to, you know, coach said, go out and run five miles. So I went out and I ran five miles. And so I had knew how to do that part, so to speak. But it was eventually was at a point, no matter what I did or how many YouTube videos I watched and, you know, take a minute off your mile now and all those things, I had reached a point where I was plateauing and there was, I wasn't making any improvements or I wasn't getting, putting less wear and tear on my body. There was no, I could tell I wasn't improving anymore. And so when you get that good coach, um, they give you that non-biased view because they don't necessarily know you or they don't know your bad habits or what you're doing. And they can really take a look and make changes in what you're doing so you can get better. Um, whether it's just, Hey, I noticed that you're doing this one weird thing with your stride, or have you thought about doing this? Or do you know that you're a heel striker, et cetera? Um, all the way up to, well, what are you doing to loosen up? What are you warming up? How are you recovering? All these pieces that can help make you more efficient and help take well, less wear and tear on your body. That's fantastic advice, Chris. Right on point. Okay, now you are married, you're a professional, you have two young daughters, and You've got to train a lot. You've got to travel for these races uh, and you do 
several a year. So I've got to believe our listeners are probably wondering, how are you juggling your professional career, your family life, and this OCR training and racing? How do you do it? Well, uh, kind of going back to the point you asked, you know, do we have it all calendared? And that's really where I, I am um, a calendar like a madman. Uh, and I really, whenever, whatever my next training piece or what the required training is, I have a very strong idea of what each session is supposed to do. Um, no two workouts a week are the same. There's nothing necessarily repetitive on that end. While I might repeat that workout week on week over week, it's not the same workout three times a, uh, a week, et cetera. And so from there, I can really understand what are my time commitments? What do I need to get out of it, et cetera? So that based on how my day looks out, I can go and I, you know, can I go get 30 or 45 minutes at the gym real quick to go and lift some weight? Um, because on the weight, the strength training side, you don't need to do two hour endurance uh, suck fests. You just, you need to go and do your work, but you can do it quickly and effectively and then get back along with your day. Um, I, uh, I am become a big proponent, um, for multiple reasons to go out and wake up early, um, or I'll wake up at three or four in the morning, go do my run, come back in, shower real quick, go back to bed for an hour to 45 minutes, which actually works out to be an incredible, um, almost power nap where I don't need that much sleep. I don't need 10, 12 hours of sleep. I can get away with just six, six and a half hours of sleep or maybe as much as eight, depending on the day. And, um, I'm perfectly refreshed. I can operate through the day. Um, and then on my long runs, I've integrated my girls. So, um, they come out with me. I put them in a, a Ironman stroller. Um, they become little neighborhood celebrities. Everyone knows them. And, uh, <laughs> we just go and we run it. And, um, the beauty of it is, is I've, I have taken it as an application in two ways because um, I'm a mountain runner who lives in flatland Houston. Um, yep. And the beauty of having that extra 50 to hundred pounds with me in the stroller is it helps simulate that, but it also makes me have to run with a particular um, correct form for one, not to hurt myself, but two, to really go and engage my entire lower body. And so having that weight, the push in front of me really makes up for the difference of not actually having a hill. Yeah. And, um, so I've turned into a win-win where I go and I can go and simulate some of that extra training. Um, the girls are out with me. So mom gets to sleep in, but the girls also get to go and they get to learn healthy habits. They go and get to see dad. Hey, dad's doing this every week and it's really important. And, um, my, you know, it's kind of become the running joke where the girls like to go and get their run in every morning from the house to the bus stop. And that's their, that's their, their cardio for the day. That is so awesome, Chris. You're um, exposing them to a healthy lifestyle by have, including them. It is so cool. And you're benefiting from the extra workload. That is, yes. that is awesome. I love it. All right, Chris, if you could go back and give advice to your 18 year old self, what would it be? <laughs> The biggest one I would say is there are no shortcuts to success. Um, it's all a process. And at some point you're going to have to choose your heart. Um, I've, I've definitely have learned and observed in life that the, the people who choose to tackle that hard first and get it out of the way tend to be the people who also also seem to be so lucky in life. You know, they're the ones who were there at the right place at the right time, or they're the ones by the time they're 40, they have the nice big house and they have a nicer car and their kids can go to a nice school. Um, but they weren't the ones who went off and they took extravagant spring breaks or they took extra weekends or they were skipping class um, or they were the ones who took, you know, a year or two off from work. They really are go getters and they just went and they knew what they wanted to achieve and they tackled it as opposed to um, procrastinating. Um, and so you just really have to figure out what it is. And it, it translates into really honestly every part of life, whether it's um, the work life to all the way up to the food life, you know, you can take it easy and you can eat nothing but pizza and fried food and beer, but then you're going to have all the complications of, um, of living on a healthy lifestyle where you're going to need a lot of extra medication or you're going to have other issues or you're going to run into heart problems like I did, or you can go and maybe not necessarily um, eat the most delicious thing in the world, but you can eat something that tastes pretty good. Um, but you're healthy. And you don't have extra weight and you don't feel, oh, you're not feeling lethargic all the time and you're not having extra aches and pains and all of those things that come in, come along with that choice. So one way or another, you're going to have to tackle something. It's just, I found that uh, mapping it out right away and facing it head on is the most effective way of getting it done. Chris, you just gave us one of the great sound bites of, of podcast history. 
There are no shortcuts to success. You have to choose your hard. I love that. Really nice. All right. We're going to spin into our rapid fire brains and brawn segment. That's where I'm the brawn and you're the brain. So I'm going to ask you five quick questions and you give me five quick answers. Chris, what is your favorite movie? I was going to say um, my favorite movie, if I can put on at any time and just drop it on and I, is Empire Strikes Back. I can always just put that bad boy on and I can listen to it. I think that's the best of the three trilogies. That's a, that's um, a great choice. That's a great choice. All right. What's your greatest accomplishment? Uh, my girls, hands down, uh, how I've managed to keep them alive and they're being so great. I don't know how I've done it, but they're definitely quite the accomplishment. That's that's uh, incredible. And they are two wonderful little girls. What is a goal that you are still chasing? Um, really, I've learned that if you're not growing, you're dying. So I'm always chasing um, continual improvement. No matter what I did the day before, I feel like I can wake up the next day and uh, I can do I can find a way to do better. And it's really about, you know, how can I be better than I was yesterday? Love that. All right. If you could spend the day with anyone past or present, who would that be? This is honestly a hard one. Um I've, I've thought about this one a lot and I've, I still struggle for the idea, but um, there's a lot of people I'd love to go out there and just pick their brain, whether it's sitting down with someone like Elon Musk and just really seeing how they work and how they go about it um, all the way to somebody maybe who I don't agree with um, where I could just see somebody from a different perspective. Like I'd sitting down with a Barack Obama and just having a beer with the man and, and just seeing where his mind comes from because there's so many different ideas out there and it's always good to expose yourself to something different just to see where the world is. Yeah. Yeah. And those two would be very interesting to spend time with a lot to learn from both of them for sure. Okay. Where's your favorite place to travel and visit? Um, I would say a, a default place for peace will be anywhere on the, on the water, whether it's by a river or a lake or the ocean. But if I had to choose truly one particular place, um, I would say it's Montauk, New York, the, the most Eastern tip of New York state. I just love going out there and sitting on the beach with a fishing pole and just uh, a lot of time out there with just you and nature and getting your thoughts collected. Yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful part of the country for sure. Okay, Chris, uh, you've been an outstanding guest today, shared so much great information. Do you have any final thoughts for our audience? Uh, really, just don't be afraid to go out and try something different. Uh, life always gets more interesting when you're going out and you're trying to do something new. So go out there. Don't be afraid to put yourself out there. Um uh, Go try to, to always find a way to do something better than you did yesterday. And you might really surprise yourself. It's the amazing how the body will follow what the mind tells it to do. So nothing's impossible unless you tell yourself it is. Chris, thank you again for this memorable conversation. I appreciate your insights, and I'm sure our listeners will as well. If any of our listeners would like to connect with you, what are the best ways to do so? Um, well, if you wanted to talk to me professionally for my day job, um, the best way to, would be is to find me on LinkedIn. Um, you can search me pretty easily under Chris Wheeler, um, MBA or Chris Wheeler, CMPSS. Um, those are two acronyms I have attached to me. That's pretty easy to find me on Google. Um, or if you're looking for me on the fun side, you can always find me um, on OCR Addict. Uh, OCRaddict.com is the website. Um, also on Facebook, you can search us on OCR Addict and you can find me right there. Or you can search my shenanigans at War Paint Waldo on Instagram and you can find me there as well. Very good. Very good. Well, that's a wrap for today's Brawny Conversations podcast. Special thanks to our guest, Chris Wheeler. And I also want to thank each of you for choosing to listen to this podcast. New episodes are posted each week. So please remember to follow us and let us help you shorten your learning curve. Have a great day, everyone. You have been listening to the Brawny Conversations podcast. Thank you for choosing to spend time with us today. And please subscribe to the podcast to receive our latest episodes and give us a follow on social media. New episodes are now in production, and we can't wait to share them with you. Pursue your passions and help others along the way. Have a great day, and thank you for listening.